So I would like to start by acknowledging that there are many different kinds of Quakers in the US, let alone in the world. And um, this is a map from 2002, so it's outdated already. Um, but even this just showing the variety and um, diversity of Quakers in the United States um, helps us keep, you know, have a little bit of um, perspective. And so today, and also some honesty, today we're going to be focusing on the way that we clerk in Philadelphia yearly meeting um, and other meetings similar to that. Um, we have a lot of different yearly meetings represented here on this call. Um, and the hope is that we will work from that perspective and also um, that some of the other ways that Quakers practice their faith will sneak in and influence, influence us a little bit along the way. Uh, we could spend our whole workshop unpacking the meaning of meeting for worship with attention to business, but instead I wanna share with you this brief description from Paul Lacey. The purpose of a meeting for worship is to turn our attention to the source of all love and joy and truth, to be led that, by that source in the tasks of life, to know one another in the fellowship of those seeking to turn to that ultimate source, to learn to love one another, to take joy in one another, and to do the truth in mutual support. The purpose of a meeting for business is exactly the same as that of the meeting for worship. During meeting for worship with attention to business, our jobs as clerk is to help steady the meeting. Uh, we need to stay grounded, centered, and fully present. We provide stability, kind of like the ballast in a boat to help keep things upright most of the time. Sometimes we still capsize. Um, and so that's the central work of what the clerk does in meeting. And luckily, as Pat McBee is going to talk about in the afternoon. The clerk isn't the only one doing it, but it's super, super important that the clerk is doing that. We're all doing it together. Um, so while we're discussing the rest of what a clerk does, you can always come back to this as a touch point. Stay grounded in God. Stay open to God's nudges. Stay centered on that ultimate source, as Paul Lacey put it. So I am, oh, oh, I'm going back and forth. Uh, actually, Zachary, can I just ask you, are there any questions at this point in the chat? Um, there was someone who asked for your full name and email and then- Oh, sure, one. yeah, absolutely. I will um, make sure I'll put that in the chat uh, when we're in small groups so that everybody has that. Awesome. And then another request for you to attach your notes to the chat. I don't know if that's possible. I'll have to send them out afterwards. Okay. But Great. No, my promise. That's it. Okay. The clerk provides the basic structure for meeting for worship with attention to business and does a ton of prep work. And I am not going to lie. It's a lot of work. Um, and the reason the clerk does this is so that everyone else can participate in the meeting with knowledge that the clerk has, the, has, got, has got your back. You know, the, the clerk is keeping the meeting safe and on point um, the way that a spotter keeps a gymnast safe. Um, and this is why the trust between the meeting and the clerk is, well, this is one of the reasons why the trust between the meeting and the clerk is so important. When the meeting trusts the clerk to catch them before they fall or to help them fall safely, um, the meeting as a whole is much more likely to be able to turn our attention to God and to uh, allow ourselves to be led by God and to do the truth and mutual support. So next, let's think about what the clerk does to provide that safety. In order to know how to keep the meeting on a steady course, it helps to do, like I said, preparation. I highly suggest having a whole bunch of one-on-one -on -one conversations with folks to help you understand some of the dynamics of the meeting. You might've already known about some of these dynamics, but you might never have explored them, or you might not have thought of them from the perspective that I'm gonna ask you to think about them. Um, first, if you're clerking a meeting, talk to those who have clerked before you, if you can. Get a sense of how they did it, what they do differently, what they think is the most important things to watch, 
their sense of dynamics. Um, don't assume that their way will be your way, but get to know what they're thinking and get a different perspective that way. Talk with people who you've experienced as being ones who ground the sense of your meeting. These are the folks who seem to know exactly what to say next or when to ask from the floor for friends to settle into some centering time. Ask them how they prepare for their meeting, what their sense is of the dynamics and how they experience the prompting to speak. Talk with friends who seem marginalized in your meeting, and this is really important. Ask them about their experiences. How do they prepare for meeting? What does their investment in your meeting look like? Do they feel fully valued? Are there cultural barriers to their being fully respected and included? Do they feel loved into full participation? Are they newer to the meeting? Are they old to the meeting and still coming back and what keeps them coming back? Or are they old to the meeting and kind of grumbly and on the way out the door and what's that like? Um, see this as a chance for you to learn, not as a chance for you to change that mar marginalized person, but for you to be changed. And then I also highly suggest talk with people outside your own meeting and within your meeting whose clerking style you appreciate. Talking with clerks can really help uh, to, for you to get a sense of your own um, clerking style and can also really help you deepen your own clerking practice. Ask them about when they've felt movement of the spirit while they're clerking. Ask them how they've gotten through things that are really tough. Um, and friends will find that it, these friends will find it a joy to reflect on these things with you. So um, please ask. Prior to the meeting, the clerk has a lot of work to do in shaping the meeting. Um, the clerk takes care of a lot of boring bureaucracy and administrivia. This frees the meeting from having to tend to that as a whole. Like we, are, don't, we don't have to be a committee as the whole when the clerk is doing this stuff. And it allows for a more prayerful meeting for worship for business. And this takes time. When I craft the agenda, I write out as thorough a list as I can, and then I will it, whittle it down from there. Uh, so I, I look to the previous minutes for anything that was held over from last month. I put out a call for new agenda items. I look at the agenda from a year ago to catch things that occur annually, like nominations and budgets and things like that. Um, and if there is a secretary or a coordinator, I, I'll ask them to. And give some really strong consideration to how you, what order you put things in on the agenda. There are a lot of opinions on this with going a lot of different directions. And um, so I'd like to refer to you, refer you to um, the packet from New England yearly meeting that I sent out in the um, pre-registration materials or the, the welcome materials. And that'll also be in a, a resource packet that you'll get at the end. Um, so read through that rather than us trying to cover that here. Make sure you identify who will present each item and make sure you know they're gonna be doing that <laughs> um, in advance before they're there. Some clerks like to attach a number of minutes to each item and put that right up there on the agenda. Um, and others feel that that puts an artificial boundary on where the spirit may lead the meeting. Um, I take kind of a hybrid approach. I put minutes on the meeting, on the agenda as I'm crafting the agenda uh, so that I can be realistic about what I'm gonna put on the agenda. But then I remove those times from what I send out to the uh, meeting as a whole so that we also have a sense of, um, of openness about our time. It helps to get supporting materials um, well enough in advance that you can really read them through thoroughly and ask questions if needed to ensure that it's really ready to come before the meeting. This is one of the most helpful things that a clerk can do in advance in terms of this sort of administrivia kind of thing. Um, it helps the presenter to be more prepared and it will help ensure that things are communicated clearly to the meeting. The more prep work a clerk does here, the more likely it is that the meeting will be able to focus on what's really important. And that's the goal. We're doing a lot of, of stuff that seems boring <laughs> in a lot of ways. And the reason is that it frees us. It frees us to pay attention. I prepare an annotated agenda 
And um, so I take my agenda and I expand it and I include any notes that I'm gonna need um, for that particular item so that it's right there in front of me in the meeting in the order in which I'm going to, um, it's gonna come across in the meeting. And also know yourself and know your foibles. And for instance, I often forget to stop and ask if people have questions. So I literally have it in my notes here today. It says, stop, look for questions, because I know that about myself. I know that otherwise I'll just steamroll right through if I don't stop and ask. And I will, but not right now. Um, I include draft minutes on my own annotated agenda for anything where I anticipate a decision. And it's just a bare bones minute um, that I expect will change during the meeting um, so that we're better reflecting the sense of the meeting. But again, doing the, the structural piece in advance helps me to be able to listen for sense of the meeting and be present to the other people in the meeting during the meeting for business. So for example, if a, if a committee is bringing forward a proposal, I might ask them to draft a minute in advance, or I might craft one based on what they're proposing. Um, for, for simple, for routine, I shouldn't say simple, for routine matters, um, having it in advance, it just ports from one meeting to the next, like uh, friends approve minutes from 04-22-2019 with the following corrections and leave a spot to fill that in. Uh, and I share those things with the recording clerk so that they're not scrambling either. We also shape the meeting by how we open the meeting, how we state sense of the meeting, how we acknowledge who's going to speak, all sorts of things. And these are important things to pay attention to. Think about the needs of a particular meeting, all sorts of things like um, whether there needs to be a blurb at the beginning uh, for quarterly meeting. I always explain what quarterly meeting is because a lot of people don't know. They don't even know what it is. Um, if you think there's gonna be a lot of new people at meeting, people who aren't familiar with Quaker process, uh, consider reading, for, reading out something like the um, welcome to meeting for worship for business. Um, there's a, a sample of that that's really excellent in the packet. And I'll make sure that you have that at the end too. When you drop back into silent worship is a way that you shape the meeting. When you stop and read back a minute of decision, that helps shape it. And giving people choices. Should we hold this over? Is this something that needs to be seasoned for a while? That helps. Um, and please consider the consequences of not taking action because that in and of itself is also a decision. And sometimes it's a good decision to make, like, um, you know, we're just not ready to move on this and we have all the time we need to think about this. Let's hold this over. And then other times it, um, in other times delaying a decision would mean a decision. It would mean that somebody is asking for financial aid to go to a retreat and they're not able to if they don't get it on time, for instance. Um, and so let's stop and think, what is God calling us to do here? Is God calling us to make sure this minute is worded precisely? Or is God calling us to help this friend get to this retreat? Sense of the meeting is, I'm gonna, actually, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm going to take a breath and ask Zachary, um, were there any questions at this point? Yeah, um, some people have been privately chatting me questions. Okay. Um, I encourage you, if you have a question, just to put it in the whole shebang. Um, in any case, there's one from Elaine about, do you share the agenda with members before the meeting? Oh, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Um, putting that out there at least a week in advance is, is really great. Um, different meetings have different practices, and I would encourage you to uh, find out what your meeting's been doing and whether it's served them well, whether it needs to be adjusted. Cool. And there was another question. Please give an example of a minute that you might attach to the agenda. It seemed like some folks weren't sure what um, like that version of a minute. Oh, sure. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah. So um, in the way that we usually do recorded minutes in the way we usually record minutes in Philadelphia yearly meeting, there's a lot of discussion, like, you know, one, you know, friends raised, raised concerns about X, Y, and Z friends spoke in support of, but, you know, A, B, and C. Um, but then we come to a decision. We might come to a decision that says something like, um, friends welcomed, um, Zachary Dutton into membership at Central Philadelphia Monthly Meeting of Friends and um, Elise is going to convene a welcome. So that's the type of, of minute that I might add into the um, annotated agenda because it's a decision that we're making as a whole and it's something that we're coming to unity in uh, about in the meeting itself. Great. And then there was a follow I there was a follow up about adding estimated times on the agenda. Do you, was that part of what you were suggesting as well? I so personally, this is one of those things where um, getting your own sense of what works for you as a clerk will be important. Um, I, I put that in there as I'm developing the agenda and I leave it on in my annotated agenda that I have in front of me but I send it out to everybody else. That's the way that I've done it. I know people in my own meeting often keep those numbers attached to the agenda when it goes out um, so that everybody in the meeting can help kind of um, keep track of staying on, on, on track with what we're, we want to accomplish with the meeting. Okay, there are other questions. I don't know how much time you wanted to take. Yeah, I think we'll move on and, and we'll see Great. if we can to some of those at the end, just because here. So sense of the meeting. Um, when you, um, people have put a lot of really good thought into this. So instead of trying to come up with my own, I'm borrowing from Barry Morley. Um, the sense of the meeting, when we seek the sense of the meeting, it is a process of surrender to our highest natures and the recognition that even though each of us is possessed of light, there is only one light. At the end of the process, we reside in that light. We have allowed ourselves to be led to a transcendent place of unmistakable harmony, peace, and tender love. We must lay aside personal needs and grievances. We must be willing to reach beyond what you or I want. The sense of the meeting is not discovered through competition of ideas. Outcomes should be determined neither by rhetorical skill nor logistical brilliance. The test of reason is not the test. Though compromise and moving toward consensus are tools we, that can assist us in the process, they must be laid aside as we reach for the inward presence. Ideas should be heard thoughtfully and respectfully just as messages and meeting for worship are heard thoughtfully and respectfully. Sense of the meeting requires listening rather than contending, weighing rather than reacting. It involves a process where we promulgate, argue, and a consensus involves a process in which we promulgate, argue, and select or compromise ideas until we can arrive at an acceptable decision. When we seek the sense of the meeting, the decision is a byproduct. It happens along the way. The purpose of seeking the sense of the meeting is to gather ourselves in unity in the presence of light. So folks had questions in advance about how do you know when you're arriving at sense of the meeting? And um, by and large, most everything I have read and experienced as a clerk says, test whether there's a sense of, of the meeting when you feel it forming. And folks will let you know if you're wrong. So don't worry about being perfect. Uh, in fact, some of the best meetings for worship for business have been when I was dead wrong, when I said exactly the opposite of where meeting was going. And I heard this resounding no from the floor of the meeting. And everybody knew, everybody knew that where we were as a meeting and it wasn't what I stated. So don't be afraid to be wrong. Anyone who's done a project with a young child may know the feeling 
that it would be easier, faster, cleaner, neater, et cetera, to just not let the child help and get it done yourself. Um, and I've had it where I've clerked an item and I get a sense of the meeting and I state it and everybody rejects it. And then another eight minutes, we come on back to exactly the same sense of the meeting that I stated earlier. And um, it took me a while to understand the pace that my meeting needed to arrive at the sense of the meeting together. And that's, it's an important practice that we have as friends. Um, and in a meeting that has a lot of seasoned friends, the meeting will usually push back hard <laughs> when, you're, when you're pushing too hard as clerk. And that's, that can be helpful. Uh, there's an art to finding that pace. And you'll have to find it for yourself. Uh, the value in allowing us to take the time that we need to take is that we'll hear the quieter voices and the marginalized ideas that might otherwise just not get heard. Um, and another thing that it can do is sometimes a member will have strong feelings, but we go a different way with the decision. And that extra time allows that member's heart to soften to the decision and allows us to move forward with that person still feeling valued and loved. There are a lot of sort of typical tricky things that clerks run into. Um, and I would, I, I put a list up here because I'm hoping that people, we have a lot of really deep experience, a lot of wisdom on this group. So take a look at this list and think whether you have an example that you'd be willing to share briefly of one of these things and raise your hand in the reactions if you have something that you are uh, willing to share. So I'm gonna tell a story while people have a chance to, to think that through. Um, if I'm clerking and I have a strong opinion about an item, I often call an elder in advance and talk it through. And at least once that has been the morning of the meeting or less than an hour before the meeting. Uh, and there was one time when I called a friend because I was aware of some committee drama that had concluded with one member simply saying, I'll just lie to the meeting. Everyone will believe me. I'll just lie. And I was like, what do I do? What do I do if, if I know that somebody's lying on the floor of a meeting? So I, call, I phoned a friend um, and this friend who's just amazing. I'm sure she said it much gentler than this, but what I heard was, do you think you are the only person that God can speak through? And that brought me down to right size and I really needed that. So, and it turns out nobody lied on the floor <laughs> of meeting, everything was fine. So I'm going to stop share because otherwise I'm not gonna be able to see. Uh-oh, let's see. There we go. Uh, to see who has raised hands. Whether there are friends who are willing to share a story of their own about when they've experienced someone saying that they'd like to stand in the way or when a meeting is forward without unanimity. Phil. Phil and I know each other well, so he will take it well when I say, Phil, is this a brief story? <laughs> well, I've got three or four stories, so I'll just pare it down to one. How's Thank that? you. Thank you. Um, Chestnut Hill Monthly Meeting had quite a bit of difficulty with a couple of people in our meeting over our building our new meeting house. And by the by, I have found that the most troublesome decisions uh, a clerk has to deal with are the ones having to do with finance and property. Um, there were a small group of people. Every time a new step was taken, about building the meeting house, felt a need to speak to their view of the truth. And this was wonderful. 
we needed to be reminded of what they brought up the first time and the second time and maybe the third time. But it became the same objections, the same points raised that they stood aside from the previous three times. We never did come to a satisfactory way of handling the situation. And I think the issue was that we didn't understand that standing aside means standing aside. That there is no way a single person can block the sense of the meeting, though it may be very important that that person's objections be minuted. Uh, it would have been helpful to us if the clerks, multiple clerks over multiple years, if one of them had simply done a little bit of research and spoken perhaps in a minute of exercise about what standing aside and standing in the way really meant. I think it probably would have created a crisis in the moment and brought us together much better as a unity later on. In preparing for today, I um, found out that different yearly meetings have different practices listed in their faith and practice about whether to list names for people who have asked to stand aside. Uh, in Philadelphia yearly meetings, faith and practice, it says it's up to the person who's asking to stand aside. New England yearly meeting, I've, I've got to say that personally, I appreciate the depth of grounding that New England Yearly Meetings Faith and Practice has on this, that if we minute people's names, that's, it's kind of undermining the sense that we're actually listening, we're waiting upon the Lord, that we're listening for God. Um, and also that sense of like, our, you know, as, as Phil was saying, can we, do we even have the authority to stand aside? The meeting decides whether a person's concern is, you know, raises to the level to continue to wrestle with it. There's a question in the chat about how much dissent is acceptable and still consider that unity has been reached. If one or more friend will object and decline to stand aside. Um, I'll share that there was a membership that came up in our monthly meeting, in my monthly meeting in Central Philadelphia, um, where I think three or four people said that they were standing aside from being in unity with uh, welcoming this person into membership. And we decided as a meeting, we needed to drop down into worship at that point. We needed to take a breath, step back from who knows what about whom and return to that central idea of what is God calling us to do here. And the clerk had been ready to move forward and accept and welcome this person into membership. But after we dropped down into worship, it became really clear. And somebody who was a very close friend of that person said, I don't think that we're in unity here. So how there is no there is no magic number. There's no formula. Um, and then I've also been in meetings where I, I can think of one meeting in particular where somebody said that they were standing in the way 
And everyone else was very clear that that was not coming from a place of being centered in worship and worshiping God instead of process and things like that. And the meeting moved forward. And it took longer than it ordinarily would have to come to unity, of course. Um, but it happened the first day that that thing came up. There was no holding it over because it was super clear. So there is, there's no litmus test. And this is this is not for shy. Yeah, this, this is not for shy people. I, I almost said this is not for shy people. Shy people can absolutely clerk. This is not for um, people who are faint of heart. And we also have a question about length of a packet to be sent out in advance. I don't have any um, particular insights on that. Um, I've seen it work all different with all different lengths. Um, and a lot of it depends on like, if, if the meeting is considering things of a techni highly technical nature, you're gonna have more stuff go out in advance. Um, but I also like to try to make sure that it's not so long that people don't read it. So I am pretty practical about, I try to be, no, I shouldn't say I am, I try to be practical about that. Packet distribution date versus Zoom link date. I will um, I'll say, look at what has been working well for your meeting or what, what, what your meeting has been doing and hasn't been working well and adjust from there. There's again, no magic formula. Deborah, Deborah. Thank you. Um, I wondered if you wanted another example of what- I would love one, yes, please because I would love some insight about it. I'm thinking of a decision, this was, uh, gosh, probably 10 years ago when friends were trying to decide um, whether or not to adhere to regulations requiring those who are working with children to fill out background checks. And, hmm. um, some friends were, felt that we should um, stand against the state, so to speak, and not require those kind of background checks, that it was being complicit with um, government regulations that they were not in favor of. And then other friends knew that it was really an important requirement to have for, children, for people who were going to work with young people. And... Um, <clears throat> We, we ended up moving ahead, as I believe many meetings did. Uh, but I would love your insight about that one. Wow. So this definitely pits two, um, two things against each other. One is this Quaker idea that we are a, um, we got rid of the uh, laity, not the priesthood, and that we are a priesthood of all believers. And this idea that some people really do have expertise that's valuable. Um, as somebody, oh, it also just kind of, oh, it gets me right here to hear that. Oh. Um, that sounds like a question where I would really explore the question of what is God calling us to do and what does doing nothing do? And what are the what are the consequences of not requiring it? Are there not going to be any children in the meeting anymore because we choose to do that? And is that truly what where God is calling us? To? Oh. I remember when we first began that process in Central Philadelphia meeting and people were just taken aback that we wouldn't trust each other. And this is a good reminder that Quakers are humans. Quakers have the same percentage among ourselves of alcoholism 
of domestic violence, of all kinds of things that we wish we didn't do. We're human. Thank you, Deborah. That was a really, that was a really helpful story. Um, there's a lot more conversation about this, but I want to move us into the next section because I promised, I promised to give you a magic formula for being able to handle everything that clerking throws at you. So here we go. Okay, so we're shifting gears to talk about how we manage all the work. I'm not gonna say that these ideas will make it easy. Clerking is a big job and it requires a lot of preparation, but these ideas might make it doable. And I feel strongly, very strongly, that there is a spiritual basis for wanting to make this doable. We want to share our leadership more broadly. We want to bring forward and celebrate the gifts of a larger swath of our members. We want to bring forward and celebrate the gifts of, um, oops, Sorry, we want to hear from and be led by people who are in different stages of their lives, people with a variety of different responsibilities and concerns. When I became clerk of my meeting, um, the previous three clerks were people who did not have full-time employment, I think. And I'm almost positive that two of those were fully retired. And I had a full-time job and a newborn. <laughs> I was a very different kind of clerk, and the meeting was up for it, and I'm so grateful. Um, there's a meeting I used to attend in California where the clerk of the meeting mowed the lawn at the meeting house. It wasn't getting done. There wasn't enough money to hire somebody, so the clerk did it. And I am throwing no shade on mowing the lawn. It can, it's super important. Keeps down ticks. Helps us from all getting Lyme disease. Uh, keeps the neighbors happy with us. And it can be a prayerful practice, but if you're not the clerk who can also mow the lawn, be really clear about it. Um, you might need to say no to mowing the lawn so that you can, sit, or say no to creating the first draft of the budget because nobody else is doing it, or calling around to see if you can get a better deal on property insurance because you're sure that it's out there. <laughs> You need to say no to things so that you can say yes to having the mental space to clerk committee coaches, uh, to say yes to spending time shaping the agenda, to connecting with marginalized members of the meeting, to having a spiritual practice of your own so that you have something to draw from. So what are the things in your meeting that no committee is doing, no officer has it in their job description and no paid staff takes care of it. So the clerk ends up doing it. I would like us to crowdsource a list. And um, Zachary, if you can put that in the chat box. This is a, when you click on that website, there'll be instructions on how to add. You can just add everything that you know of that is a, um, an extra duty, extra duties as assigned um, that the clerk ends up doing. And then I'll share that out at the end of the, um, like after, uh, materials that get sent out after the workshop. And then there's also a list for um, only the clerk can do it. And there's definitely some things that those that fall into that category. Um, so I, we have such wisdom on this call that I would, I think all of us would benefit from you adding your wisdom to it. Kathleen, do you want me to share both Padlets right now? Or just... Yes, yeah, go ahead and share both of those. Okay, I'm gonna reshare them both with labels in the chat. Oh, perfect, thank you. I'm gonna pause a minute while people have a chance to put their first impressions in. Somebody asked me to define these items. So um, something that nobody else but the clerk can do, I would say is um, establishing what the agenda is gonna be for business meeting. 
and sending, um, you know, sending out that draft agenda. Um, things that people other than the clerk could do, I definitely <laughs> would put supervising in that category. Uh, that was one of the things that I asked at Central Philadelphia, if somebody else could supervise the secretary. That's one of those things that takes a lot more time than people realize it's gonna take. Um, if there is a, uh, a board or an interfaith group that your uh, that your clerk has always been the one to represent your meeting. That might be something else um, that somebody else would be able to take on instead of the clerk themselves. So those are some ideas. Zachary or Kathleen, could you explain briefly how to add a sticky note to this Padlet? Okay, I'm hoping that there is a. There's a one sticky note that's on there that gives you the instructions. I, so if you um, double click anywhere on the page, you'll be able to add a note. And there's also a plus sign in the bottom corner. And you can click on that to add a note too. Uh, got you, thank you. Mm -hmm. So that's gonna stay open for the duration. Some of you will certainly have more to put on that list and others. Working is kind of like gas in that it will expand to fill the space that it's given. Um, so it's really important to think about what your boundaries are. How much time can you put toward clerking and then stick to the boundaries? In order to set boundaries and limits, I started by making a comprehensive list similar to what I'm asking you to help us with here today. Um, and then I identified, is it that the clerk has to be the one to do it? And what could somebody else do? And I also identified which of these things are really critical that somebody does it and which might be a little bit more optional because sometimes we do things out of habit rather than there being a genuine need for it. And then I delegated what I can. Um, with my monthly meeting, we hadn't had an assistant clerk and I asked, well, actually nominating committee said, will you need an assistant clerk in order for this to work? And I said, yes, yes, I will. Um, so the assistant clerk was an amazing, amazing person who was willing to just take on what I couldn't do. And we divided and conquered. Um, we also looked to see what committee clerks might be able to take on because sometimes maybe the property committee would be the right person to do something that the clerk would it has been doing just out of out of habit. Um, and then once we figured that out, I wrote up a newsletter article and we sent that out to everybody so that we're really clear and um, just really open about how this is going to work. With clerking the quarterly meeting, which I do now, I stated up front that I was not gonna be the clerk who also mows the lawn. Uh, but then I also said, I'm going to make mistakes and I'm probably going to bring some of the chaos of my family into meeting. And I didn't apologize about it. And I said, maybe there's even a gift here for the quarterly meeting in experiencing this and getting a different perspective. Um, and then when I make mistakes, I try to be really transparent about it and model interdependence and imperfection and community. Um, and then, and I also stick to my boundaries and that is super, super important. Um, when we're juggling, we are by definition, always dropping things. And the trick to it is to catch it before it falls and hits the ground. It's dropping, <laughs> whether or not we catch it is the trick. And, um, and sometimes we do, it does hit the ground and we all, if we all see that together, that can be helpful to the meeting. Uh, once when I was first day school clerk, I just told the meeting clerk, we're not gonna have all the age groupings we normally have because people haven't said yes to leading the kids programs. Um, the committee had done its work we had diligently gone out and asked. We had been prayerful about it. We everything, and people hadn't said yes to service. So 
sometimes the meeting needs to see what the consequence is of, of not saying yes. Getting and staying organized. Um, I have a short, short list of tips and tricks on this one, unfortunately. Um, having minutes for the past several years in an easy to navigate list, super, super helpful. Um, I'm developing that for quarterly meeting right now um, because it's, it's so helpful to be able to pull it up without having to paw through a lot of folders and so on. I also keep a running agenda uh, and it's a doc and I just dump agenda items in. It's, you know, shorthand stuff. Um, and I keep it for, you know, I think I have it out at least a year, year and a half. Um, and then that way, like when I do, when we put the budget forward for one year, I can also stick it in the next year so I don't forget. Uh, also, it makes it super easy to pull something forward that didn't get covered in one meeting or that got over for another because it needed further consideration. Um, and I can just pull it from one and stick it into the other. Um, you can see up here, I also have something from Pat Loring. I must have um, had some thoughts about, <laughs> about our meeting needing to, uh, what our meeting needed to consider to have a, a more centered practice that particular month. Um, for Central Philly, at one point, I copied and pasted minutes from, I think the previous five years into one long Word document. And then I used an auto index function in Word. And it's not elegant. You get all sorts of weird things pop up in the index that way, but it was helpful. And I'll admit, I don't know if Word still does that, but it's just another thought. So experienced clerks tell us, how do you hold good boundaries in a loving way? How have you shared leadership? How do you stay organized? Able, if you have uh, stories to share with us, raise your hand. I know that a lot of folks on this call have years and years of clerking. I might be hitting you a little cold with that, I'm sorry. Give that some thought and if we have some time at the end, we will, oh, Joan, hi Joan. Unmute. There we go. I'm not sure I have a story, but I, um, a practice, um, as clerk of a quarter, you get a call, like, I think we should do this, you know, that sort of thing. And what I did just this morning, as I said, you know, that's a great idea. You need to, con you know, contact others in other meetings about this concern you have. And then you know, lay out an idea into maybe a plan and then talk each of you to your meetings about this and then come. So that's both uh, good boundaries and shared leadership, I think. <laughs> amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Joan. Yeah. David. Yeah, um, thanks. One thing, we used to have a real challenge having getting clerks um, because the practice had been that once a person was a clerk, they were sort of a clerk. And once we came into uh, really redefined and thought about terms, uh, it made a lot of sense and really recognized and talked to the meeting about a responsibility for everyone at some time to be clerk. And people sort of started to hear that and understand it. So what we do now is that if you're a clerk, you're a clerk for uh, two years. Your first year, the prior clerk is your assistant, or the, um, the assistant clerk is a prior clerk, and your last year, you are, and, and uh, then you're clerk for two years, and then your fourth year, you are the assistant clerk for the rising clerk. So it's a really a four years. You're assistant clerk for um, the current clerk, then your clerk, and then your assistant clerk for um, the past clerk or the current clerk. So it's a, 
it's a defined term that people have started to get comfortable with and recognize I'm not going to be clerk forever. So it, it's just been, uh, uh, it's been something that's worked well in our meeting. Amen to that too. And you know what else it does is it brings up the next group of leaders because they know, because they have somebody with experience who's helping them figure it out. Exactly, exactly. So, so they're comfortable knowing that they've got a prior clerk right at their, yes. right at their shoulder, right at their hip the um, whole time. And so that's, that's, that's um, made it easier, much easier to um, help people say yes. Being oh, I love it. Thank you. Debbie. Um, I think that I want to spring off a little bit of, of what um, was shared a little bit earlier. And that is there were as a quarter clerk, you know, there are often all those good ideas that Joan talked about. But I try to do a really good job of listening to whether a friend is processing and needs um, to be heard in a way that would be helpful to moving an issue forward or whether sometimes they just wanna be heard. Um, there's many times that people say, here's what we should do and here's why, blah, 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 yeah. but aren't willing to pick it up and carry it. But you know, oh, well, we should do this. And so being in that space as a clerk of listening and I'm then sorry. being again. able to help the people tag into, connect to, our process and group or whatever else, but to, to understand the difference between what we should do and somebody who is just um, processing. Debbie, I'm gonna interrupt you for just a second. Um, friends who are not speaking, please be sure to put your phones on mute or your computer on mute. Thanks, sorry. Um, it sounded like you were coming to a conclusion, but uh, where, did you have any addition? No, that okay. was it. Okay, good. Yeah, 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 definitely. Um, Deborah. Yeah, I, um, I have been in conversations about the role of the clerk as spiritual leader. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, sometimes, um, sometimes we have a wonderful combination of a person who is clerk and who is also a strong spiritual leader, uh, but it doesn't always work that way. And, yeah. and so just having permission for those roles to be different or something, I wonder if you could just comment a little bit about that. Yeah, different, different clerks definitely have different gifts to bring to the role. Um, I mean, I was always calling people to help center me down. <laughs> Because I know I get a little bit like <laughs> when I'm clerking and I need, um, you know, I, I need somebody who will just help me drop back down. Absolutely. Um, and something that's a little later on in the, and another thing that people were asking about is, or saying that they were afraid they weren't going to be good enough at clerking having a fear that people were gonna see through whether they knew what they were doing and things like that. Um, sometimes if a, if a clerk has, a, has the bureaucracy part of it down, but the spiritual gifts not as much, um, knowing who to look at in the meeting, knowing which Hollywood Square, if you're still doing it on Zoom or which person's eye you can catch and connect eye to eye to help just bring you right back down. And oh man, that's so valuable. Um, that might be, I have not thought about that in terms of helping people understand their own gifts and whether they had that spiritual component or not. But that is something that um, nominating committees could do well to remind friends that they don't have to have all of it and help them find the pieces that they don't have. Jillian? Yes, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how it fits into the questions you've got up there, but you suggest, and I do practice talking to people before a meeting to see if they're prepared and where they're going to help me as the clerk for organizing the meeting. But I 
think I tend to be a manipulative person. And I find there's a, there's a, a diff, a, at times I do that. And then I wonder if I've manipulated something behind the scenes and that could come up to bite me. I, that's my, yeah. my own worry that I need to be very much aware of. Is there somebody in your meeting who you can talk about that with when that, when that realization hits? That's a good thought. There are several. I have just started clerking and I have asked a group of four people who were former clerks to be there for me when I have problems. So yes, I could bring that out, but I just wanted to, you know, you said to do what I do, but it's a fine line. You're right. Absolutely is. And I find myself walking, you know, I think I share a similar trait with you on that. Um, so again, going back to being honest about being imperfect, um, can I also highly recommend, you know, after you check in with somebody, if they're like, yeah, you might, uh, um, you can go back to that committee clerk or whoever it is and say, look, let's revisit this. I might have steered you a little bit too strongly in one way or another. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the, the honesty with that too. Are there, um, I don't see any other hands. Um, Zachary, are there questions that I should be? Oh, oh, I can pull them up. Huh. Part for the clerk within the meeting. Yeah, we just talked about that, good. Um, it helps to be held in the light by a specific member. And I think it is helpful to remember that we all need to hold the clerk in the light. Amen, amen, amen. And I've been that person if, if a clerk has been, or actually with a, I have a good friend who's a, who's a minister in another denomination. And I have attended her services at, so that she knows that I'm there holding her in the light. Okay, what to do with conflicts? This is something that a lot of people asked about. Um, there are four basic responses to conflict. Ignore it, deal with it indirectly, address it directly, sever the relationship. And some of those are ways that we only use very rarely, but all of those approaches have a place. Um, when is it best to ignore a conflict? Um, when you don't see any benefit from addressing it. And this might include when somebody's pushing a point that's not actually affecting the meeting's decision. Is there a way that you can just gracefully let them say what they feel needs to be said and, and keep going? That might be the right thing to do. Or if you're getting a sense that somebody's trying to get a rise out of you. Uh, when is it best to deal with it indirectly? That might be really important if there is a history of really destructive conflict between people and having those two people work together on that conflict <laughs> might just be exactly the wrong thing to do. Um, severing a relationship is extreme and something we are so, so hesitant to do as Quakers and sometimes we need to do it. And I'll tell you why. Um, if that is the only way that we can uphold the dignity of the person who is the target of the conflict, sometimes it is the right thing to do to sever a relationship. Remember that Jesus called Peter Simon to shepherd the flock, to tend the sheep. A shepherd has a sheepfold around the sheep for a good reason. The shepherd puts the sheep into the sheepfold for the night and lays across the entry so that they know if somebody's trying to come in and steal the sheep or if, if there's a wolf trying to get in or a sheep trying to escape. And to some degree, we as clerks are called into that role. It is so important, especially for people who have just, who've been marginalized over their lifetime. 
So the fourth way that I hadn't I haven't addressed already, addressing it directly. And this is like letting the air out of a balloon. When we have an underlying conflict that's not named, we can feel the tension kind of like the air inside a balloon is providing the tension that pushes the balloon outward. Um, and when we name the conflict out loud, it's like letting the air out of the balloon. We release the tension and we can deal with the conflict. And like when we let an air out of a balloon, there are a lot of different ways to do it. Uh, you can pop a balloon. That sure lets the air out. Um, you can let it go and let the balloon fly around the, the room uh, and have no control whatsoever. Um, you can pinch it a certain way so it makes funny noises. I just think that's fun. And, um, or you can just hold it and let it deflate in a controlled way. And there might be times and ways for each of those, you know, when each of those are appropriate. It is absolutely critical that we as clerks pay attention to being anti-racist in how we if you're not already familiar with what white supremacy culture is, please learn. It's in your resource packet. I've got it listed here, what the website is where I got this list. Um, and pay attention to what we call Quaker process and what aspects of Quaker process is actually paying attention to God and each other and what parts of Quaker process is more about culture. I see every single one of these characteristics play out in Quaker meetings. And please know that I'm not asked, and the either or, the binary part is kind of like a, an umbrella, an umbrella piece of this. Please know I am not asking you to stop taking down written records, written minutes of the meeting just because uh, worship of the written word is on this list. Uh, but keep in mind, if someone is only going to accept documented proof of something before accepting a recommendation or a decision, keep it in mind of whether somebody is insisting on written proof or written documentation before they'll believe some, that something that happened. That happens all the time in our Quaker meetings, in our government, in all kinds of places, it happens in Quaker meetings. I'm not asking you to stop acknowledging the person with a career in finance. Um, when trying to build a budget, um, but also pay attention to which voices are amplified more often and more loudly. Budgets are moral documents and not everything in them is best analyzed in a spreadsheet. And when we go back to that question that Deborah raised about um, background checks, I mean, you know, that's not an, a, an either or, there's, there's some nuance, you know, we need to pay attention to experts there. And yet we also need to make sure that we are not uh, privileging experts to a point that plays into um, white supremacy culture. So I'm asking you to consider whether the way we're using these various aspects of Quaker process in ways that are bringing us closer to God, or if it's worshiping cultural practices. That's, that's the question I'm lying, laying on you today. And this website um, lists a description of the poison, so to speak, and also a list of antidotes to try, and a warning not to use this as a weapon. And that gets to the, back to the either or binary thinking. Um, these are some practices that cultivate mutuality, and it gives you some positives to work toward. Acknowledge power, name it, say it out loud. Lead with purpose. This brings us back to the purpose of meeting for worship for business. Appreciate our diver diverse strengths and evolve together. This includes naming each other's gifts. And I'm, that's such a, a wonderful thing for us to do as a meeting. And if you haven't already, practice how to respond to comments like these. Um, if you are somebody who doesn't encounter these kinds of things in your day-to-day -day life, role play it with somebody. Make sure you're not caught flat footed on the floor of business meeting. Um, I was 
a lot younger <laughs> than I am now when I was clerking Central Philadelphia meeting. And whoa, like when somebody stood up and said, well, I don't see race, I was just like stunned into silence. <laughs> um, I, I have a little bit more experience now, I'm glad to say. I'd like us to have some time to break into groups of four and have a chance to discuss conflict because this is something that there's such a rich, con uh, a rich topic. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I'm gonna put these questions in the chat box so that you'll have them when you're sharing. I'm also gonna check the chat box. Uh, Okay, um, so I'm gonna stop sharing. And Zachary, can you put us into groups of four? So inclusion and accessibility, we have only a few minutes left. So I'm going to move forward to the questions and then I'll go back to the quote so that we can sit with the questions as we hear the quote. How can you as clerk help build an inclusive meeting? What are things you can just do? on your own? How will you gather more information about accessibility needs in your meeting? So um, this is from an article in Friends Journal. And this is specific to mental health stigma, um, but I'll, I will, share openly that I, um, as a parent of some young kids who sometimes had some struggles, um, there are many ways that people can feel stigma in the media and ways that we restrict accessibility to young parents, to people with, you know, different challenges, um, time challenges, family responsibilities, financial responsibilities. Sometimes stigma looks like people offering to hold someone in the light in a way that is not really hearing or seeing them. Other times stigma comes in the form of patronizing or rescuing someone rather than recognizing their unique strengths and gifts and welcoming them as a full community member. Stigma also looks like limiting someone's potential to participate in the life of a faith community Stigma may place a diagnostic label on someone and may make that their identity, seeing them as an illness or as broken. So I'm wondering if folks have thoughts we, um, whoops, here we, on how we can build a more inclusive meeting. And maybe some of the things that we've learned in Zoom can contribute to helping us to improve that accessibility. So go ahead and raise your hands if you have some ideas on this. Kate. This is right up my alley. I have a number of serious mental illness issues. I never know if I should say illness or health, but because I, first of all, I do not keep quiet about it because I am involved with my meeting. I am extremely active, extremely as in not I do everything, but I really cherish working with my meeting and I love my community very much. And as somebody with a number of diagnoses who is willing to call out for prayers and for help, it's my little way of telling people who perhaps have not been diagnosed that it's okay if they are, mm -hmm. and maybe making a little pathway for people who are struggling with mental health challenges. I will share that parents of children with special needs um, 
really need to be to have a conversation. So this last question, how will you gather more information about accessibility needs in your meeting? Um, not every kid with ADHD is going to have the same needs. Not every kid with a reading disability is going to have the same needs. Um, and so it's going to be important to talk to the parents. Um, this is another place where talking to people who are marginalized, you might discover things about accessibility that you hadn't even considered. Cheryl? Well, what you just touched on was one of the things I was going to say is that, again, you need to approach this with a sense of curiosity because we don't always know everything. We don't, yes. things are not always what they appear. And it's always good to um, ask, what is it that we can do to help support you? But when you do that as a meeting, you also have to recognize, and this is something we've been talking about, what are the expectations that people have of meeting? And what are the expectations that meeting has of, of the people in meeting. It's a two-way street. And so we cannot promise more than what we can deliver, but a discussion about that is really important because that's where generally a lot of people get upset and leave meeting is that they expect something that meeting really isn't in a position to provide or that we ha as a meeting haven't really codified what we can give, what, 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 we are there for. We can't be there for more than, um, well, this gets into a whole big discussion. We're there for spiritual support. Anything other than that is a negotiation at that point. I feel like I can't leave that uncommented upon that if we are a religious society of friends, we are called to do justice work. We're not called only for spiritual support. But I also take your point. Jen? Um, <clears throat> I'd like to expand the idea of accessibility to uh, being in the pandemic and using Zoom a lot. Uh, we have a couple of opposite ends problems. We have people who just can't deal with Zoom on the weekend because they Zoom all day long at work and they are exhausted. And so even though Zoom opens up accessibility to some people, it closes us off to others. And I think we also need to be cognizant that some people have um, te technological abilities and some people don't. And maybe we need to uh, talk to people and see if they need some help or a little class in Zoom or, you know, maybe they're afraid of it. And also to let people know when we're meeting on Zoom, when people are meeting with different technologies, different things are available to them. For example, um, our clerk was um, had some, some problems with people being angry at them because they, they weren't called upon and they didn't realize that he was on a phone and couldn't see most of the people. So we, when we found that out, then we as a meeting said, oh, we can help you with that. We can tell you so-and-so's hands raised. Yeah. And, but I don't think everybody understood that people had different stuff on their screen, that there were different uh, yeah. speeds of different computers so that could make things appear differently. And so I think that's something that we should consider in accessibility also. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. Phil. The word gifts has come up several times in our session. One of the things that I've seen be very helpful for promoting inclusivity, if you will, is a deliberate effort on the meeting's part, which doesn't mean the clerk's part necessarily, to recognize, name, and support 
the gifts of its members and attenders. By doing it publicly, they're lifted up so that people who might not have noticed can see, hey, this person has something to offer us. Hey, this person is a contributing member of our community. Uh, it's the opposite of calling out. It's the opposite of marginalizing or silencing. And it can be very helpful. We are just about at the hour and I have a gift for some friends who have expressed that they think that they're not going to be enough as clerk or that they're afraid that people are gonna notice that they're not perfect. And that is, remember the meeting wants you to succeed. I felt like a poser too, and men, all of us, every single one of us are gonna feel like a poser at one point or another. And do you remember when um, Simone Biles talked about getting the twisties? Like she just kind of lost her place in space and time. Clerks get that too. Remember the meeting wants you to succeed. So as much as we spot the gymnast, there's somebody much bigger than all of us who spots us and the meeting as a whole is spotting us. So that, oh, I forgot I had one more slide um, with resources. Um, I just want to mention, I'm gonna send out a list of resources and I highly suggest that you read as much as you can um, and several sources on the same topic will help you to kind of find your own style. Um, and be sure to flag the things that you wanna be able to find and come back to. Um, and balance what you read to cover a, a breadth of topics. Um, and if something lands wrong, talk with somebody about it. Sometimes it lands wrong because it's wrong. Sometimes it lands, for me, when something lands really wrong, sometimes that means I really need to learn something from this. Um, Carol. As a newbie, your readings were fantastic. Of course, I had to wait until 11 o'clock last night to start them, but they oh, really God. were fantastic. I enjoyed them. Thank oh, you. Oh, good, good, good. I'm so glad. So I will remove this from our screen because that's a little stressful looking. <laughs> and end with us on the screen. Oh, thank you, dear friends. Um,